want your Bible? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, someone left a Bible. Trevor's is yours? Anyway, everyone else can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 19, and whoever's this is, we'll just have to borrow someone's. Um, it'll be fine. So it's good to see everyone here this morning again. Welcome back from break. We prayed for you all, um, and just good to have you back here as we make our way through the Gospel of John and finally uh, on to Easter. Just a couple of family notes before we uh, actually look at God's Word. First of all, just note, if you weren't here for the announcements, we do have potluck today after the service, so please feel free to stay. Go down to the the fellowship hall, and it's always just a good time of hanging out together. And thank all of you for all the work you put into that as well. I do want to talk a little bit about these kingdom prayers that we just... Um, prayed. Carol mentioned that we've added a new category, which is to pray for our nation. We always have. It's always been on the list, but we're just highlighting it for the next year or so, because if you're paying any attention to the news, it just seems obvious to us that as a nation, we're at least headed towards some kind of crisis, at least regarding our federal government. We want to be aware of that. And Paul tells us in his letter to Timothy that we ought to pray for those uh, that are in authority. And he tells us to do this so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. So we're, we're praying for our country to remain at peace. And we're going to rotate back and forth between praying for government officials Uh, as well as praying for societal issues. Often in churches, they kind of just pray for one or the other. They pray for the president and the military, or other churches just pray for various social issues like poverty and racism. We want to mix it all up together and say all of it needs prayer if you're paying any attention at all to the news. Uh, And we're not just going to pray for um, one part of government. We're praying for all parts of government. And our system, our king, that we are to obey as Christians is the Constitution. And so that means we pray for those that hold constitutional office uh, and those that also restrain those office bearers. So uh, we pray for the president that uh, he would execute God's will. We also pray for those that would restrain the president's power uh, in order to provide a balanced and peaceful society. Um, And if you are, um, even as we head to this crisis, the other thing we want to do is live peaceful lives with one another. We're going to have different opinions as things um, develop. Some of us here, if we are at all reflective of American society, some of us sitting here already believe that the president should be removed from office. Others peacefully and lawfully according to the Constitution. Others support his policies, uh, while obviously uncomfortable with certain aspects of his character. But either way, we pray for him, and we pray for those that are investigating him. We pray for peace to prevail and the rule of law, and so that the gospel can go forth in this country again peacefully, and that the church would remain godly and united, remembering that we unite around a gospel of grace. And Jesus Christ as king, and not any political party Uh, of earthly origins. We also remember, even as we pray and have our opinions, that God often draws straight lines with bent sticks, and we pray for that. Even as we might disagree with people politically, we pray God uses them for good. And so this is why we're going to focus on this. Um, We don't know exactly what ought to happen or what we ought to do, but we do know that we can pray, and we need to pray, not just for our nation, but for all the nations of the world. So I just wanted to introduce that to you before we we go to God's word. And now we are going to turn to John 19 as we continue to go through the gospel uh, of John and continue to look at the cross. And today we actually finally come to the death of our Lord Jesus for our sakes. And we're just going to read a few verses. We're going to read John 19, verse 25, and then going through verse 30, 25 through 30. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. 
After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, um, we would bow before the crosses, even as we have already prayed this morning and sang, and we would reflect on what the death of Christ means for us and for the whole world. We pray that you would properly humble us and sober us in light of what your son went through for us, and yet also show us that this was your plan. And so fill us with the joy that Jesus himself now bears. Oh, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. In the summer of 1986, while I was still in college, I, I spent a summer in Istanbul, Turkey, on a mission trip uh, trying to befriend and reach Iranian uh, refugees there in Turkey. As you might remember from your history books, there was a vicious war uh, for eight years going on between the nations of Iran and Iraq involving all sorts of horrors like chemical warfare and Iran being out, uh, uh, out armed and so just sending forth uh, young boys without any weapons to go before the army to set off landmines and uh, all sorts of other horrors like that. So a good number of Iranians made it into Turkey illegally and there they were, if you will, staying in hotels, homeless, without a job and without any uh, sense of hope or direction. So a number of Christians went to Istanbul uh, to try to befriend them and just show them the love of Christ and as opportunities arose to share the gospel. Well, one pair of Iranians which I met were these uh, two 13-year-old twins, fraternal twins, a boy and a girl, and, and they're very friendly, extremely intelligent. Their English was excellent, much better than my Farsi. And so I was trying to think of creative ways to explain the gospel to them, knowing that the actual cross the physical symbol was uh, an offense to many Muslims. And so I thought maybe one way I could communicate it was by writing out a comic strip, if you will. And so that's what I did. I, uh, once a day, I would, I would give them one page with four panels on the page and I uh, colored carefully and with, with words in English. Again, I didn't know Farsi very well. Trying to explain the gospel story to them and in fact, if you're one of the kids, I think I can find, I took every day I went and Xeroxed the page and then before I gave it to them, and I think I still have a copy in my office if I can find it in my horizontal uh, filing system. But I turned the gospel story into an allegory of sorts of a distant land where there was a righteous king who had a people that were tricked by an invading monster. And the invading monster turned the heart of the king's people against him and so that they became rebellious. And so the only way to solve this, and you know the story, is for the king to send his son and be and live among his people and teach them the right way. And in order to signify that this man was different than the rest, I was trying to figure out how do I do that in the comic book. And so what I did is I, I drew a heart above the king's son where, wherever he went. And I had in mind maybe that heart was signifying the love between the, the, the king and his son, which might sort of symbolize the Holy Spirit. So I, if you know your theology, I worked in some Edwardsian theology into this comic strip. And so then when it came to the time for the king's son to die at the hands of the king's rebellious people, I had a question in my mind. What do I do with that heart above his head? What would you have done? How would you signify what that death did to that love? And so what I did was I didn't know what to do. I broke the heart in two. When we read about the death of our Lord Christ, our hearts break, or they should, if we have any sense of our own sin, as we confessed earlier in the service, if we have any sense of Christ's love and holiness and grandeur. And that's the picture that we have here. 
And so like last week, all I want to do is go through the details that John lays out for us one by one so we can understand the love of Christ for us upon the cross. And we begin in verse 25, where we read that as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he's already been arrested, he's already been beaten, he's already been condemned to death, he's taken his own cross, and there he is hanging, nailed up on this tree, barely able to breathe at all, suffering tremendous physical and spiritual agony. We read that standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and then these three other women standing there. And we also read that John was there. We read this in verse 26. Uh, John uses that little nickname for himself, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we, John, you ask, why does John tell us he was there? Well, I suggested last week well, from Pastor Rollo the insight that there, that is why John is the apostle of love who writes about love because he saw love personified upon the cross dying for him. But there is another reason, if you want to flip ahead to verse 35, where John says, he who saw it, in other words, me, has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may also believe. John's saying, I was there. I'm not bragging about it. I was there, though. I saw these details, and I'm writing them down. But the main people that were there at the foot of the cross, John wants us to be very clear about this. We're not the apostles. We're not the men that Jesus had raised up to lead his church, but these faithful women. Now, we don't know much about them other than they were there, except the emphasis is on Jesus' mother being there, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And here, this story where Jesus recalls down, I mean, he could barely talk, but he tells Mary, behold your son, and John, behold your mother. And we read from that day on, John took Mary to, into his home to take care of her. The whole point John wants us to see is even as Jesus is dying there on the cross, he's loving his church, he's loving his family. We, he could barely speak. This is one of the seven last phrases that he utters upon the cross, what we often call the seven holy words of Christ. John has recorded three of them. And there is a lesson for us in this. Jesus' death on the cross brings us the forgiveness of sins. It brings us everlasting life. It's everything but it wasn't a mere theological exchange. It wasn't a cold courtroom transfer, the way some people call it. Like we just say, oh, thanks for dying for me, Jesus. Thank you very much. Now I get to go to heaven. See you later. No, it's not like that. Jesus does not go easily and nonchalantly to his death just to buy us a product that we then get by faith alone, and that's very good. Thank you. I'll stick to the book of Romans. No, Jesus goes as a supreme act of love for us. And here we have a picture of that. Here he's taking one of his very last remaining breaths to show his love for his mother and his love for John. Oh, and of course, Jesus is going to be back in three days. But after that, he's going to be there for 40 days and then gone again. And so he has a, there's a picture here of Jesus caring for us, even on the cross. His death did not just get us a ticket that gets us to heaven. Jesus now cares for you. And he loves you. And here's a picture of this. Now, some commentators over the centuries have gone too far, I think. They've made this into an analogy where they say the disciples which Jesus loved, or an allegory, is not so much John, but the whole church, and they're venerating Mary. And so I don't think that's what's going on. But there is a picture of us here of Jesus saying, it's more than me just forgiving your sins. You have to take care of each other. And how could John refuse there at the foot of the cross? But there is another aspect I want us to see. One is, again, Jesus showing his love and that he takes care of us through the church. He loves you. He does continue to take care of you. And here's a picture that, that he does that through one another. That's why we're here. But there's another aspect. And that it is that John highlights that it is women who are at the foot of the cross and then later are the first ones to discover the empty tomb, which is remarkable in that culture. And as we mentioned, as we see this as all part of one story of redemption, I think it signifies the reversal of the curse of sin. You all know the story, if you've been around a while, how sin entered the world through Eve, who was deceived. But the question is, where was Adam? I believe he should have been there guarding his wife uh, standing up to the devil. I think that's what 1 Timothy 2.15 teaches, if you know that verse. And so now here at the cross, 
the apostles, the men who Jesus raised up, they have all fled except for John. And it is these women who minister to Jesus in his greatest time of need. And so after all, we can just ask, you know, the question. How was it that Jesus redeemed the world? And here we see the curse being reversed. It's the women that were there. In fact, these might have even been interviewed by Luke as he wrote his gospel. They're the ones that saw what happened. And we ask them, is this part of the bigger story? You just ask, how did Jesus enter the world to begin with, to begin this process of remaking the world? It was through a woman, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so, uh, rightly, the church has always recognized her that way. You know, um, I heard a, a famous preacher say recently, as he was speaking to a group of men and trying to get them to man up. He says, whenever God wants to get something done, he does it through a man. And I thought about that and I said, oh yeah, except for redeeming the whole world in which he comes through the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so rightly, from the beginning, the church has always recognized that there is, besides the Lord Christ, there is one person who is more blessed than all others. The woman who got to bear God himself in her body, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And here she is, watching this son whom she herself bore and gave birth to, watching him die in agony upon the tree. She could be nowhere else. You see that she has to be there to be witness for how God is remaking the world. And so that's why later in the New Testament, in a very sexist and misogynist culture, we see women given places of honor and respect in the church as a counter society. And so we read about Paul's co-workers in the gospel. We read about Women like Nympha and Aphia and Junia and Phoebe and Priscilla and Euodea and Syntyche and Mary and Tryphania and Tryphosa and Lydia and Chloe and Lois and Eunice. Did you know that there were that many? Now it is true that even as these women are in the, in the New Testament, it's very clear. It is true that is all in the context that the scriptures are also very clear that men are to publicly lead and teach in the church that elders and pastors are to be men. And you say, well, why is that so if we are all equal in Christ? Well, this is not a sermon for that, obviously. But it's because two reasons, I think. One is to reinforce and reflect uh, the male headship in the home, which was part of the original creation order before sin kind of messed that all up, you see. And so as the, church, as the husbands are to be leading servants of their wives, so it, the church should reinforce and reflect that. But, but more than that, I think it's also part of reversing the curse, that God would actually raise up godly men by his grace that would do what Adam failed to do with God's help, that we would then lead and guard and take the hits and be on the front lines, not so much as a duty of prestige and honor, that's not what it's about, but as to, to fill our proper role as servants. It's what Jesus says, if anyone would be great among you, let him become a servant of all. And he says, for I, even I, the son of man, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom of many for many. And so Jesus is our head. He's the king of the church. And so he, he infiltrates the men he raises up to be servants like him. It's reversing the curse because that's what the curse did. It kind of messed things up between men and women. We're always blaming each other. So here's the thing. I really think this is a picture of this here at the foot of the cross. It's not that men and women are competing with each other for power. And John saying to Mary, I'll do 50, you do 50. No, it's together in their own roles. They build one another up properly. It's restoring the harmony of creation. I do think we see that picture here. Now, even as I'm preaching this, that men are to lead to build up and encourage others. I'm not sure I've always done this well myself, either in my marriage or the church. I'm not sure I've always led my sisters like I should or respected them as well as I should. I'm still learning. I'm maybe not as bad as that one preacher on the internet I said, I heard. But the point is, is that sin disrupts and alienates and the cross restores us to our proper roles. And so you may think this is all far afield uh, from the cross, but I think John includes this story for a reason.
that the cross doesn't just forgive our sins, it heals relationships. It restores harmony as the Holy Spirit works through his church. It brings us together, loving one another, taking care of one another. I mean, why, why don't they just write straight theology here? Why is John getting distracted by, John, by himself taking care of Jesus' mother? It's because that's part of what Jesus came to do, that he'd raise us up to be servants to one another, to reflect his love. After all, as John sees love dying on the cross for him, how could he say no to sharing some of that love with others? And so... This is what we aim for, we ought to pray for, and here we have a beautiful picture of this, even as Christ hangs on the cross. So now let's move back to him. After all, he is the main event. Uh, His dying on the cross is what makes all of this possible, which breaks down walls between us, which humbles us. And so now we look at verse 28, and here we read, that after this, you notice the transition there. After this, Jesus has taken care of this, knowing that the church is going to continue after his death and ascension. After this, knowing he'd done everything, knowing that all was now finished, he said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. This is one of the very last things he says. It's just one small word in Greek, but it's full of meaning. I thirst. That alone is heartbreaking. Here he is, three hours upon this cross. Again, having already been beaten and humiliated, barely able to breathe. Here he is, the God who made the oceans, the God who made the rivers. The man who came to the woman at the well in the desert in Samaria and who tells her that I give living water. And then he goes on to tell her, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a a spring of living water, welling up to eternal life. That's what Jesus gives us. But here now, Jesus is saying, I thirst. Jesus became weak and thirsty in our place so that we may drink our full from him. He takes our place. Have you ever felt spiritually thirsty? Have you ever felt worn out and just wiped out? Well, then come to Christ who took that place for you. He thirsts also, and more than you ever will. And so come and let him be that spring of living water for you. But notice also how John makes clear to say that Jesus said this very simple word. Why? To fulfill scripture. Well, what does that mean? I think several things. First, because The Old Testament scripture prophesied that he would thirst on the cross. You might remember Psalm 22, which John already has recited in verse 24, where they divide his garments among them. Remember, he has that one tunic that shouldn't be ripped because it's so valuable. And I read in one commentary that that shows that he's wearing the, 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 the tunic of the high priest. But this also was prophesied in Psalm 22. So also we read in Psalm 22, Jesus says, or David writes a thousand years earlier, talking of Jesus, my mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. And so it's been prophesied, but there's more than that. It's also what was said in Psalm 69, which Trevor read for us earlier. You know, you remember this. Here we have it prophesied. Answer me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me, which God doesn't on the cross. That's the whole point. Do not hide your face from your servant, which the Father does. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. And so Jesus knew this was written about him. And he says, I thirst, knowing what they would then do. Because what do we read in verse 29? There was a jar full of sour wine stood there. And so they put a sponge full of the sour wine. They put it on a hyssop branch and they, they held it to his mouth. You might remember what a hyssop branch was from the Old Testament. It was this bushy branch. They actually used it for painting 
And so somehow they put a sponge on that stalk. They, they raise it up to his mouth. And who knows what their motive was? It might have been that they hear him say, I thirst, and all they see around is a a jar of sour wine, so they give him what they can. That might be it. Or perhaps they did it to further humiliate him, right? In the same way they put a crown of thorns on his head to mock his kingship, so now they hear he's thirsty, and they say, let's give him some sour wine. Let's give him vinegar to make him even more miserable. Have you ever drunk something that just surprised you? I don't want to make light of this, but I couldn't help but think when I was reading this about a time in my life where I had gone to an office of a fellow pastor of mine because we got together weekly to try to study Hebrew together and, and bone up on that a little bit. And as I sat down to meet with him, I was thirsty and there was my travel mug full of coffee. And so I put it to my lips. And as soon as I did that and I drank some, he said, what are you doing? And I said, what? And he goes, you left that here a week ago. And it's been sitting there all week. And I panicked and I opened it up. And sure enough, all sorts of blue mold was growing on it. And I drunk it all. It ruined my day. (laughs) And so instead of getting refreshment, I got bitterness. And this is what Jesus is saying. I'm thirsty. I just want a little bit of water. But instead, they reach up to him and give him bitterness. So here is Jesus hanging between heaven and earth, the one mediator between God and man, and all we can do is reach up to him with the bitterness of our sin for him to bear and absorb. And there's also clearly a reference to the Passover, if you know that story there, because as you know, the the Jews were to, to eat a lamb and take some of the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost so that God's wrath would pass over them, and they were to do it with a hyssop branch. And so if you were a Jew of the day and you read this, it's not like hyssop branches were in every verse of the Bible. You'd immediately think, the hyssop branch, that's what we do to cover over our sin. Here is Jesus representing us so that God's wrath would pass over us as well. He is the Passover lamb. But you see, there's even more to it than this. Look again at verse 27 or 28, where Jesus says, knowing now was all finished. This is why he wants this. It's all done. And so he wants the sour wine. And then we go down to verse 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, when he had received it, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. You see, Jesus is seeking this out. And the Gospel of Mark tells us that he shouts out as he dies. He wants a little bit of moisture on his lips so that when he says this, everyone hears, it is finished. When he's talking to Mary and John, he only needs them to hear him. But he wants all of us to hear, it is finished. He knows this is why he came. This no, he knows this is why he was born of the Virgin Mary. This is why he grew up and taught and taught and established the church and called 12 apostles. This is it. It is finished. And he knows that in the Old Testament, it often speaks of drinking the full cup of God's wrath. That's why back in John 18, when Peter draws out a sword to defend Jesus, Jesus tells Peter, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? That's what Jesus is saying. Knowing it's all finished, give me that wrath. Let me drink the cup of your sin and God's wrath in your place. Let me bear the bitterness which you deserve. It is finished. This is why he came. This is why he welcomes that sour wine to his lips because it symbolizes his welcoming, bearing the wrath of God in our place. It is finished. And so when he was done, when he had paid the price for our sins, he's nothing more to do. He's done. It's over. And so he dies. That's not a bad thing. That's victory for him and for us. He had paid the price. It's done. Blessed relief. 
And we know from the other Gospels that immediately he went up into paradise. Remember the thief on the cross said, remember me, and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. His agony is over. His suffering is done. The strife is over. The battle is won. This is why the author of Hebrews tells us that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so, yes, be sad that Jesus went through this for you. Know the price of sin and rebellion and what it cost God. But then, like Christ, according to Hebrews, rejoice. It's finished. It's done. That's why we don't have a crucifix here at the front of the church. We don't stare at the suffering Jesus every week. We prefer an empty cross surrounded by joy and light. For this is why he came and it's done. It is finished. And so now we live in the joy of the life that he comes to bring. And we just want as many people as possible to enter with us into that abundant life as we proclaim the death and resurrection of Christ. And think about this in terms of your own sin and guilt. What price do you still have to pay for your sin? It's finished. What do you have to do to earn God's favor and make him happy with you? Nothing. It is finished. It is paid. What words of rebuke do you think you're going to hear on Judgment Day? Absolutely none if you are in Christ. It is finished. The judgment is past. That's exactly what Jesus tells us in John 5 and 24. And one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible where John says, Truly, truly, really listen up. I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes, him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. That's already happened for you. If you are in Christ, if you trusted him, you do not enter into any judgment at all. Jesus bore it for you. It is finished. Jesus was found guilty in your place. And, but because Jesus was not actually guilty or sinful, as we read earlier, but because he was perfectly holy, then when he dies, even though he didn't need to, then death is defeated in him. And three days later, he rises in the body. And that's what we celebrate at Easter. That's the joy that we live in now. So do you see this? Jesus broke death. Right? We talk about breaking all sorts of things. People break cars and break the Internet and all sorts of things. Jesus broke death for you. And for everyone who clings to him and is part of the new humanity he came to bring. And everyone who wants to know God, everyone who wants to know their creator and wants to live with him forever and humbles themselves to seek him out, they will find God in Christ as the Holy Spirit draws them and they hear the gospel proclaimed. Remember what Jesus told Martha in John 11. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you hear that? If you believe in Christ, you shall never die. You just get rid of this old thing. But your soul continues to live. That's why it's proper to say that believers pass away into glory. It's not a mere euphemism. It's actual reality. It is finished, Jesus cried. The wrath of God is past. His agony is over and our salvation won. And then we're going to go on next week to read how they made sure Jesus was dead. Uh, and, th and then how they buried him. And then we go to Easter where we celebrate the result of all of this. But in the meantime, today, as we reflect on his death, do you see how the gospel can be summarized in those three simple words? It is is finished. As we read earlier from Colossians, and you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
You see, I think our confession of sin, which I actually put in the bulletin, was too harsh in this regard. It said we're still captive to sin. We're not. We're freed from sin by Christ, even though we struggle with it. We're not captive by it. It says you were were dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh. It means unholiness. You were, but now God made us alive together with Jesus, having forgiven all of our trespasses. And by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, these he set aside by nailing it to the cross. Now, I want want you to think about the very worst thing that you have done in your life, that sin which just humbles you to the dust. I want you to know that it's nailed to the cross. It will not be held against you. Jesus bore it for you. Oh, be sorry for it and continue to repent of it as you need to. But there is no more guilt upon you. As far as the east is from the west, so far as God removed our sins from us. How could God hold it against you? Jesus stands in the way and pleads for you. This is what we call the atonement, if you've heard that word. Jesus, by dying for you and forgiving your sins, then reconciles you to God so that you live forever with him. Even in the English, uh, 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 where that word comes from, the etymology of that word. I'm trying to avoid fancy words, but there you go. Where does that word come from? It really does mean bringing us and making us one and united to God at one mint, atonement. That's what the cross has done for us. I remember years ago when I was just starting off in ministry, I was in Cincinnati at a minister's gathering, and I remember listening to one minister kind of complain about his work. He was a chaplain, and so that meant he got to go preach in a number of the churches in his denomination. And he told us that he really did not appreciate going to a particular African-American church to preach because he said they sang about the blood too much. And he was not into atonement theology. Oh boy, I wish, I wish that I had had the guts to say to him, you're not into atonement theology, are you into being saved? Brothers and sisters, atonement theology is our life, it's our salvation. It's that Jesus did it all so we wouldn't have to. It brings us life and joy forever. Because without the cross of Christ, we are all lost. We would have to try to make up for our sin ourselves, and we cannot do that, and we do not have to, because God made it up for us. And if Jesus' blood is divine, as we confessed earlier, and it is, then just one drop is enough to forgive all of our sins and all of the sins of the whole world. But we don't just get a drop, as we'll see next week. Jesus' blood pours out for us as a fountain of life. He didn't just come to forgive our sins in a cold courtroom thing, but to then give us abundant life. Because here's the thing, we need to sing about the blood all that we can. I don't think we could sing about it enough. But then as you've received Christ, he doesn't just leave you alone. He then moves into your life as that living water and he changes you. And he makes you want to be like him and pick up your own cross and follow after him in that great struggle of the Christian life, that great wrestling match that we call faith. Jesus forgives all your sins, but then he comes and he changes you and comes to live in you. This is the abundant life he came to to bring. So do you remember that comic book I drew for those Iranian teens? And I still pray for them now and again. I, I hope I get to meet them again up there. And how... At the king's son's death, I drew that the heart of God was broken. Well, I remember sitting in the apartment where we were staying, uh, crammed together, about 20 of us, and living in like a three-room apartment. Uh, It's missions work. And we were being visited by some older Iranian gentlemen, also Muslims, like most Iranians are. And I was showing him this series of comic strips I had drawn 
And I explained to him, as I was trying to explain the gospel, why I broke the heart. And this Muslim said to me, he said, if what you're saying is true, then the heart should not be broken, but it should be enlarged. Because if what you're saying is true, then this king's son's death rescues all of his people. And what could bring God greater joy than that? Again, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured all of this, despising its shame, and then now sits at the right hand of God the Father where he rules all things and works all things together for his glory and our good. So I just want to close by saying if you have not trusted Jesus with your life, if you're just still thinking about it and considering it, I just dare you to keep looking at the cross and keep reading about the death of Christ. I dare you to do that and just see if you can look at the face of God and not give your life to him and follow him. And if you have trusted Christ and are struggling with some worry, some sin, some anger, you might be at the foot of the cross and Jesus tells you to take care of someone else and you say, no thanks, I don't really want to. Come again to the foot of the cross. Look at what he went through for you. Know that he did it out of joy and to give you this joy. And then let that love fill you. And then let him use you until like that thief on the cross, one day you'll be with him in paradise. Let's pray. Our Lord God, we can hardly pray and think and sing about the blood too much. And yet we thank you that it's not just blood of agony, it's the blood of joy, it's the blood of life, it's the blood of salvation. That we are baptized into water, not into blood, for our Lord Jesus bore the death we deserved. And so we pray not only that we'd all receive that and get to live forever, but that we would live out of that. That Christ's atonement would flood into our lives that we would be instruments of peace and reconciliation in this broken and hard and difficult world. Oh, Lord, we are too weak for these things. That's why we're praying. That's why we're asking you to do this great work. And we know you will, to your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.